So, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to be able to open our academic year um, <clears throat> with, uh, with Tony Blinken uh, and Dr. Leif Kuba um, to talk about the events and uh, the previous work and looking forward uh, events in Iraq. Uh, this is uh, an important time. It's been a long time. Uh, that these events have been going on. And I'm sure we will have an opportunity to uh, go into some, some depth on this. Uh, Tony Blinken, of course, is a national security advisor to the vice president. Uh, they have spent a lot of time uh, in Baghdad and around Iraq, um, most recently just last week. Um, but they've been there, I don't know, six times in the past uh, short uh, months, and uh, we'll have a lot to say about this. Uh, uh, Tony Blinken will be followed by Dr. Leith Cooper, um, who is now the director of Mideast and North Africa at the National Endowment for Democracy, um, but is a longtime participant and observer um, of Iraqi politics. And so we're looking forward to Dr. Cooper's uh, comments as well. Following that, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions, and uh, we look forward to that part of this discussion as well. So, Tony. Thank you. Bill. Uh, Thank you very much, and good afternoon. It is uh, great to be here, great to be with all of you. Uh, as Bill said, to try and uh, kick off the, uh, the school year. Um, Bill, I just wanted to start by commending uh, your own service uh, in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, the Middle East, uh, Ukraine, uh, pretty much any hot spot we can think of, uh, you were there and uh, performed tremendous service uh, for the United States. So I wanted to, to thank you. Um, I also wanted to single out a, a couple of people, of course, uh, the head of the Institute, Richard Solomon, always great uh, to be uh, with him, and a dear friend and colleague, uh, Tara Sonnenschein, uh, with whom I worked in the, uh, the Clinton administration. And it's especially good uh, to be here at the Institute of Peace because, uh, quite frankly, the mission of this Institute is more important and more significant than ever. To have a nonpartisan group of deeply informed specialists working on the most critical issues of the day in terms of peace building, post-conflict reconstruction development, building governing capacity, um, it is simply uh, more vital than ever. The administration deeply appreciates the work that you do. Uh, when I worked on the Hill, uh, I know that Congress appreciated it very much as well, and we are looking to you to continue to carry a very heavy load uh, on these very difficult uh, issues. Um, President Obama ran on a commitment to end the war in Iraq responsibly. And last week marked a very important milestone toward that goal. Our combat mission in Iraq is over. Uh, the Iraqis uh, now have lead responsibility for their own security. We've removed roughly 100,000 troops from Iraq uh, since we took office, from nearly 150,000 when we came in to about 50,000 today. And we will make good on our commitment to remove all of our troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. Until then, uh, our remaining troops will advise and assist uh, the Iraqis, uh, take part in, in partnered counterterrorism operations, and of course protect themselves, uh, our civilians, and uh, critical infrastructure. But just as significantly, we are not disengaging from Iraq. The nature of our engagement is changing from a military lead to a predominantly civilian one. Put another way, even as we draw down uh, our forces, we are ramping up our civilian engagement, uh, political, economic, diplomatic, to deepen Iraq's sovereignty, uh, self-reliance and stability, and to build an ongoing partnership between the United States and Iraq. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about these uh, civilian efforts uh, today. But first, it's important to set the context that this change of mission uh, is taking place in. If you step back and look at the big picture in Iraq over the past uh, 18 months or so, um, I think it's this. Violent incidents are significantly down. The capacity of the Iraqi security forces is significantly up. And politics has emerged as the basic currency for doing business in Iraq. If you were just reading about Iraq in the daily newspaper uh, or watching television at night, you might come away with the impression that not much has changed there, that Iraq continues to be more of the same, suicide bombings and attacks. 
And to be sure, extremist groups continue horrific acts that take innocent Iraqi lives. Iraq remains a dangerous place. And so uh, our civilians, our diplomats, our troops remain uh, in danger. But the facts are these. The number of weekly or monthly security incidents in Iraq is at its lowest level since 2003. There's been a dramatic decline from the dark days of 2006, 2007, and the level has stayed down consistently. Two quick examples. The week uh, that ended September 3rd, last week, total nationwide attacks in Iraq decreased from 136 to 102 from the previous week, below the 12-month average of 111. Let me put that in perspective. During the darkest days of the insurgency um, in 2007, there were 1,800 attacks in one week in June. And for about two years, 2006, 2007, the average number of weekly attacks was about 1,400. Now, if you're the victim of one of the 100 attacks that are taking place, that may not be much solace. But there is a clear trend, a clear picture, um, and it's been sustained. What does this mean for the Iraqi people? It means, as we used to say in another context, that the quiet blessings of a normal life are increasingly within reach. In Baghdad, people are going out to shops, to restaurants. Markets are bustling. Homes are being built. There are traffic jams, and not all of them caused by security checkpoints. If you talk to reporters who are based in Iraq, they will tell you that for all of the remaining problems, they have more freedom of movement and access now than they've had at any time in recent memory. And maybe most important, uh, while the attacks uh, do continue, they have not achieved their strategic objective, which is to relight a sectarian fuse or fundamentally undermine confidence in the government. Um, and in fact, when you talk to Iraqi leaders from across the political spectrum, they characterize the remaining attacks not as an insurgency, but as acts of terror by a small, relatively small group of extremists on different sides who uh, are not getting traction with the Iraqi people. The progress that we've seen, of course, is due in substantial measure to the extraordinary skill and professionalism of the U.S. military forces who have been and remain in Iraq. And we had an opportunity to talk about that in Iraq last week when the Vice President was there, Secretary Gates, Admiral Mullen, uh, General Mattis, and others for the change of mission and change of command that some of you may have seen on television. Uh, but this progress is also due in no small measure to the increasing capacity and professionalism of Iraq's security forces. We've trained about 650,000 uh, Iraqis, including very effective special operations forces. And there's evidence of this increased capacity and professionalism. The Iraqis took the lead in securing the recent elections and did a very good job. In recent months, Iraqi-led operations based on Iraqi-developed intelligence have helped kill or capture 32 of the top 42 al-Qaeda and Iraq leaders. And they are taking on Shia extremist groups uh, as well. Maybe most important, the Iraqi people have decisively rejected violence, and their leaders have embraced the political process as the best way to secure the interests of Iraq's various communities. That political process is rarely pretty. Uh, it's almost never linear. Uh, but the evidence in recent months is that it's working. Uh, we've been through a series of sky-is-falling moments uh, in Iraq. Consider the events with the election law and the controversy that erupted around that, uh, debathification efforts right before the election, the challenge to the election itself. Every time people said, this is it, this is a crisis, the sky is falling. Each time the Iraqis used the political process and constitutional means to work through the crisis, the sky did not fall. Of course, uh, it's also true that the sun has yet to rise on a new government in Iraq. And the length of time it's taken to get that government in some ways is not um, unexpected. Uh, last time, in 2005, 2006, it took about six months, which is roughly where we are now in the process. This time, the election itself was extraordinarily close, uh, as I think most of you know. Only two seats out of 325 separated the two leading coalitions, and neither is anywhere close to getting a majority needed to form a government on its own. And so we've had this process of coalitions working together to try and form uh, a majority, 163 seats in their parliament. And of course, this time, 
the stakes were even higher. Um, as the Iraqis know that we will remove uh, our remaining troops by the end of 20, 000, uh, 2011, and they are determined to get government formation right, uh, even if it takes a little longer. Unlike last time, however, a dangerous power, power vacuum in Iraq has yet to develop. The lack of government formation does not mean the lack of a government. There is a government, a caretaker government, and it's basically doing just that, taking care of the basic business of providing security, providing services, expending the budget. But of course, the absence of an elected government is not a durable solution for Iraq. Major challenges uh, remain before the Iraqis, including uh, Iraq's disputed internal boundaries and the status of Kirkuk, laws to govern oil production and, power and revenue sharing, constitutional reform, the integration of uh, Kurdish and uh, Sunni uh, um, military forces and security forces. All of these issues would benefit. Indeed, they probably require the legitimacy of an elected government to move toward resolution. Uh, similarly, we in the United States want to build a long-term partnership with Iraq that I'll talk about in a moment. But to build a partnership, we need a partner. Here, too, uh, moving forward requires the greater certainty and legitimacy of an elected government. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Iraqi people voted in large numbers across all communities for a new representative, uh, for new representatives and uh, for a new government. They expect a new parliament. They expect a new government. They deserve them. Let me uh, talk a little bit about how we see things going forward. Um, President Obama has been focused on Iraq from day one of this administration. In fact, even before day one, uh, he uh, sent Vice President-elect Biden, some of you may remember, to Iraq about two weeks before the inaugural to do a baseline assessment for our incoming administration. One of the first things the President did upon taking office was to order a full review uh, of our Iraq policy. He laid out a new policy going forward in a speech at Camp Lejeune, and then he asked the Vice President to oversee uh, Iraq policy because he was determined that we would have a sustained, high-level focus from the White House on Iraq every day. Uh, the Vice President chairs uh, a monthly cabinet meeting uh, on Iraq. He's in contact every week and sometimes every day uh, with Iraq's leaders, with our very strong team in Baghdad, now Ambassador Jeffrey, General Austin, before that with Ambassador Hill and General Odierno, uh, and indeed with uh, leaders throughout the region. Um, as I said at the outset, we are not disengaging uh, from Iraq. The nature of our engagement is changing to a civilian lead. And concrete evidence of that commitment is our decision, which the Vice President announced last week uh, in Baghdad, to open consulates in Erbil and Basra and embassy branch offices in Kirkuk and Mosul. We want to ensure that our engagement continues to cover the breadth and depth uh, of Iraq. The State Department is going to bear the heaviest burden uh, in this engagement. Dozens of tasks that were previously the responsibility of our military have now reverted to the Department of State, including a major nationwide police training program starting in October of next year. The President and Vice President are determined that as State takes this lead responsibility, we have a whole-of-government approach uh, to our engagement with Iraq, especially when it comes to our commitment to build up the strategic framework agreement with Iraq and to bring it to full fruition. That agreement uh, commits us to strengthen ties of commerce uh, and trade and investment, culture and education, diplomacy and security. Uh, we've already held a major investment conference here in Washington uh, that brought about 1,100 U.S. and Iraqi government uh, officials and private sector representatives together. Later this fall, the Commerce Department is going to take a delegation uh, to Baghdad with uh, more than a dozen companies looking at potential uh, business deals and investment opportunities with their Iraqi counterparts. Uh, this June, the Department of Agriculture brought leading U.S. agricultural firms to Iraq to explore business opportunities, and we've seen a major contract flow uh, from that engagement. Specialists from across the government, including from Treasury, Justice, Agriculture, Commerce, Interior, Energy, Health and Human Services, USAID, are working closely with Iraqi counterparts to develop Iraq's capacity. The State Department's largest Fulbright program in the Middle East uh, is in Iraq. We also have a very active international uh, visitors program. Just last week, nine Iraqi provincial council members came to the U.S. to study how our local governments interact with Washington. And I'm sure they learned some very interesting lessons from that. 
Uh, and this summer, 25 Iraqi professors, administrators, and deans from a number of universities across Iraq are spending 10 weeks here in the United States at American universities participating in programs on education, public health, linguistics, science and technology, and engineering. And we're moving forward with, edu- with efforts to strengthen our cultural and, uh, ties as well. Uh, a par- as part of the Iraq Cultural Heritage Project, uh, state is working uh, with the Iraqi government to make improvements to the Iraq National Museum, to establish a National Conservation Training Institute uh, in Erbil, and to provide training opportunities in the U.S. for Iraqi cultural heritage professionals. Uh, we'll also open an Office of Security Cooperation as part of our embassy. This is something we do in embassies around the world uh, where we have a significant security relationship. Uh, working from that office, uh, civilian and military professionals and experts will continue to provide advice to the Iraqi military and help them integrate uh, American equipment. And, of course, our diplomats uh, in our embassy will be on call to answer any Iraqi requests for assistance in working through their internal challenges, developing stronger relations with their neighbors, strengthening their economy and the provision of services, and working through Iraq's um, continuing obligations to the United Nations under Chapter 7. So let me conclude uh, where I began. Uh, President Obama's commitment to end the war in Iraq responsibly. The word responsibly uh, is there for a reason. Ours is not a rush to the exit. This is about uh, as much about what we leave behind as it is about leaving, and we're determined to leave behind a sovereign, self-reliant, and stable Iraq, and a long-term partnership between the United States and Iraq. There is a lot of hard road left to travel uh, for the Iraqis, and so uh, for us. But maybe it's an occupational hazard, uh, but I'm hopeful uh, about Iraq's future and hopeful about the potential for a new relationship with the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. I thank the USIP for inviting me, and um, it's a hard act to follow, I think, following the statement that was uh, given by by Tony. I think when it comes to the vision of the uh, administration that was um, outlined on Iraq, one can hardly disagree that uh, uh, putting more emphasis on the politics and not on the uh, military presence is the right approach. I think the development that took place in Iraq, without a question, the U.S. military presence and the surge had something to do with it. But more importantly, it's the shift in emphasis. And Iraq today has developed an army, um, and it can be sufficient, but the question is sufficient for what? I think on the first question, on the strength of the Iraqi army, everybody agrees that uh, it has emerged. The Iraqi army today is not where it was uh, four or five years ago. Uh, Today, it can fulfill a lot of its duties in main Baghdad, uh, in main Iraqi cities. Um, To fight al-Qaeda, you do not need foreign troops. You do not even need uh, an army of half a million or a a quarter, quarter of a million. What you do need is strong intelligence and professionalism. And I think this is where Iraq needs the U.S. in in, in that front, and it certainly, I think the vision that was outlined is very much in line with with Iraqi needs. The reality is, irrespective of that vision and the intention, I think perception is is important, and how uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq and that shift in strategy and in emphasis is going to be perceived by the players, not only inside Iraq, but, but outside Iraq, is as important as the policy itself. I think it's not uh, about simply outlining a policy. It's about seeing it through reaching uh, all its objectives. Uh, There is no question al-Qaeda will try to uh, take some tactical advantage out of the shift in policy. These attacks that took place in Iraq are not... Um, uh, will not pose any serious challenge to Iraq, and I think they can be dismissed as being secondary. But more of a concern, I think, amongst the Iraqis themselves about the U.S. commitment uh, inside Iraq. Um, A lot see that the U.S. is pulling out of Iraq because it's been exhausted, because it's been stretched thin. They follow uh, follow up all the speeches that are said. They follow up the news about the economy. And I think the impression it's it's a, a choice that has been more or less forced on the U.S. by reality. 
and the concern is very real amongst uh, Iraqi players about the extent of the commitment of the U.S. Uh, to seeing uh, uh, Iraq through, and I think that's one area um, I, I would flag and I would raise as, as being critical. A second issue, which is very much, I think, the elephant, there are many elephants in the room that one needs to talk about, but I think it, it needs to be spelled out, and that is with the U.S. withdrawal um, uh, currently in the, uh, amongst the Iraq's neighbor, uh, neighbors, Iran is the most influential. It had um, uh, many ways to influence and to some extent often dictate what goes on in Iraq. And I think the, the perception and the reality of America, American withdrawal from Iraq is going to be read carefully by Iran. And I just cannot foresee the next four or five years without factoring Iran into the equation. Uh, everybody knows that the U.S. is concerned about Iran's <coughs> programs, uh, Iran's um, uh, regional position, and it's very much a subject of, uh, of um, open de debates and, and private debates. And I think you cannot detach de debates about uh, on the future of Iraq without directly addressing, addressing Iran influence and how this is going to uh, to materialize uh, in the future. Uh, looking internally, the most important achievement the U.S. had after all these long years and uh, sacrifices that were uh, that that happened both from the U.S. and from the Iraqi side, Iraq has a constitution and has a political process. But it it concerns me a great deal that this constitution um, has been weakened recently by the politicians and not only. Uh, initially, initially, they started by delaying provincial elections by a year or two, and then by looking at the outcome of, of the elections themselves, and now it's been five to six months, and that constitution is not adhered to. Now, a weakened constitution in a country that is full of problems is not a good sign. The Kurds have a list of issues ahead, and the only point of reference other than violence they have is the Constitution. And if the Constitution has been uh, marginalized or the Iraqis have, have been allowed to marginalize it to that extent without uh, a serious pressure or deterrent, it's, it's a, a real worry on, um, uh, on the future of, of Iraq. On the second point, the political process, we had three elections in Iraq and the Iraqis participated by 70%, and they took a lot of risks and sacrifices and really were proud to, uh, to, to have uh, the first real democratic elections taking place in the region in Iraq. But they're extremely disappointed by the outcome of the process. Uh, the novelty of democracy is wearing off. It does concern me a great, a great deal that what Iraqis have seen as the outcome of just elections is a high level of corruption uh, and a dysfunctional government. Uh, and uh, time is running out. Uh, I think if there was a strong Iraqi army today and that Iraqi army staged a coup, it would be welcomed by a lot of people because a lot of Iraqis would like to see a functional government. I think that issue is real, not talked about often, but the ordinary people in the streets, uh, there is that growing sentiment of frustration or, or of despair of, of, of the process itself. Um, there is another, uh, 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 a third, uh, an important factor is that I think part of the U.S. strategy is to strengthen the Iraqi army, um, and the Iraqi army can be strong enough to hold security in Iraq up to a point. It cannot... Uh, it cannot fill in if the political process fails. In other words, if the issues between Baghdad and the Kurdish region are not resolved in a peaceful way, the Iraqi army cannot enforce uh, anything uh, meaningful. And I, I think there is a um, uh, there is prospect for uh, a worry of real violence that can e that can evolve if the political process fails. The other one. If the political process, for any reason, excludes the, the Iraqiya, which is the under it a lot of the Sahwa, the, the, the ones that betray us strategically and correctly, try to integrate them in the political process. But today they are in, an, in a much, much stronger position, and 
po- there is a, a balance of fear. All groups are armed, and I think everybody knows that violence is not an option, and everybody would seek that the political process ought to succeed. But the reality is if it doesn't, then I think the level of violence that can erupt in Iraq would require foreign intervention. And if that foreign inter- intervention does not come from the U.S., it might come from, from other sources. I think on the, um, uh, on the final point I make, uh, the U.S. has mm. uh, uh, brought a lot of hope to the Iraqis, not only by getting rid of Saddam Hussein and setting up the political process, but, but also by advocating a set of values to do with human rights, the rule of law, um, uh, respect uh, 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 f- for the Constitution, and under day-to-day politics and under many, many pressures, I think that the U.S.-Iraq relationships goes under, maybe those issues become secondary because there are other more important urgent issues that are forced uh, on, on, um, on governments. But I think it's important strategically in the long term that the U.S. ought to keep the pressure, both politically and otherwise. It has many leverages uh, over the Iraqi government that those achievements on the areas of human rights, on the rule of law, on the uh, freedom freedom of the press is not challenged yet uh, legally, but it might. But all these areas need to be maintained and need to be, I think, central in the vision and, 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 the, and the approach that, that the, uh, the U.S. government should take uh, on Iraq. I think um, uh, the, uh, as far as Iraq, other neighbors, which is uh, primarily um, Turkey, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and Syria, um, one view I've always held and advocated, that is, if the U.S. was to leave Iraq as it's leaving now, it ought to put some pact, some political pact that involves Iraq neighbors to avoid the vacuum and to, to avoid a power grab that can take place on a much bigger scale. The power grab that we saw in Iraq um, after the fall of Saddam Hussein was messy, but it can be much worse if the U.S. was to leave Iraq, leave vacuum, <clears throat> without a pact with Iraq's neighbors on how to bring uh, order to the region and, and to Iraq. Thank you. Excellent questions. Tony, if you agree, I will uh, give you an opportunity to say a couple of words in response uh, or to answer some of the questions. I thought uh, Leith asked very good ones in terms of the extent of the, of the U.S. commitment. Um, uh, and the obvious question is, if Iraqis who are ambivalent about <laughs> departure, and we ought to be very clear when we're talking about departure, it's not departure, it is military departure. You know, the Americans are not leaving. Uh, the military is going down. Um, there, has been, there have been conversations about what would happen if the Iraqis asked for some delay. And that I know is a difficult question and probably not one I want to answer explicitly. However, the question about Iran, um, is a good one. The weakening of the Constitution and the possibility of frustration, Leif even mentioned a coup. Um, uh, the Arab Kurdish dispute uh, being uh, one that will have to be uh, old groups that are rearmed, uh, you mentioned. Um, and finally, the pact with the neighbors to, uh, to maintain some uh, stability there that, that was not there, there earlier. Um, but, Tony, if you'd like to deal with any of those, and then we will open up for uh, questions from the rest of the crew. Sure. And you can do it right from there if you like. Great. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, look, for the most part, I find myself in violent agreement with Leith uh, on uh, everything he said or warned about. I think uh, the concerns you expressed are um, uh, many of them are concerns that we share and that we're very vigilant um, about looking toward. Um, most specifically, um, in terms of the ongoing commitment, I think there are two things going on. If you look at the polling, um, it's very clear that um, an overwhelming majority of Iraqis uh, want to see us uh, remove our troops from Iraq, 75 or 80 percent in most of the polls I've seen. And one of the things that has really benefited our relationship with Iraq is that we are making good on our commitments. Um, I think many Iraqis did not believe that we would get out of the cities uh, a year ago, and we did. Many Iraqis did not believe that we would end our combat mission and get down to 50,000 troops. We did. Probably there are Iraqis who do not believe we will remove 
our troops pursuant to an agreement with the government of Iraq by the end of 2011? We will. And making good on these commitments is a very important way to build credibility and build the relationship with Iraq. But, Bill, as you said, and, and Leith, as you, as you warned, we've also been emphasizing again and again and again, as I said um, a few moments ago, that we are not disengaging from Iraq. Uh, it's just that the nature of the engagement is changing. And even as we uh, draw down our forces over time, we are ramping up our civilian uh, and diplomatic uh, engagement and, indeed, presence uh, in Iraq. Uh, because this, too, is something that the Iraqis uh, seem to want. And every Iraqi political leader from what, virtually every coalition uh, or party, uh, with the probable exception of, uh, of the Sadrists, uh, has made it clear that they want to develop a strong relationship uh, with the United States. They want to see us bring the Strategic Framework Agreement to life. And we're committed to doing that, as long as the Iraqis want to do it. Um, when it comes to Iran and Iranian influence, uh, let me say a couple of things. First, on one level, Iran is always going to have um, influence uh, and engagement in Iraq simply by dint of geography uh, and history and uh, religious affinity. Um, and that will not stop. Um, and on one level, uh, nor should it, that's, that's just part of uh, the uh, facts of life in the region. However, uh, it's also clear to me um, and to many of us that Iraq has developed very strong antibodies against foreign influence and, and excessive foreign influence and intervention from wherever it might be coming. Uh, and that includes us. And so what we've seen in recent months is a very strong resistance to uh, meddling by anyone, uh, including the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians spent a very large sum of money on the election, and they got very little to show for it in the uh, outcome uh, of that election. Uh, no doubt they are trying to influence government formation uh, as we speak, as are a number of other countries uh, in the region. But again, uh, I would suggest that what we're really seeing in Iraq, uh, beyond the emergence of politics, is the emergence of a new nationalism. And within uh, the proper boundaries, that's a very positive development if nationalism has overtaken sectarianism uh, as the dominant uh, feature of uh, Iraqi life. Um, I don't see any, uh, any signs of uh, a coup or military takeover. Um, what we see is Iraqis committed to a political process. And the evidence I suggested, uh, whenever there's been a crisis, uh, and there have been a number of so-called crises over the past year, uh, Iraqis have not reverted to extra constitutional means. They've pushed the envelope, for sure. But at the end of the day, uh, I would argue that everything they've done uh, has been within the constitutional framework and within a political process. Um, as to the um, Arab-Kurdish uh, differences and issues, these are very significant uh, because what we don't want to see is uh, Iraq moving from sectarian conflict to ethnic conflict. And here again, I would argue there have been some very positive uh, developments, although they're not uh, by any means definitive. First, we've worked very hard, uh, and I have to give credit to General Odierno, uh, who did a remarkable job in setting up on the security side of things uh, a tripartite mechanism with the Peshmerga, with Iraqi security forces, and with the United States uh, having uh, joint uh, patrols and checkpoints along the uh, fault line uh, in uh, the north. And that has really uh, had a very important effect in um, minimizing tensions, in averting uh, problems that might arise. That's something we're going to continue. Um, the integration of uh, Peshmerga uh, into the uh, Iraqi forces uh, is also something that's very important going forward, as is the continuing integration of the Sons of Iraq. But there's another important element. Right now, based on the results of the election, the uh, Kurdish alliance is the pivot in government formation. Um, maybe kingmaker's too strong, but clearly, um, absent uh, their support, it's going to be hard uh, if not impossible, for anyone else to uh, get together and exclude them. And that gives the Kurds a significant voice, not only in the government formation process, but in the government going forward. Because think about it this way. The weakness of a coalition government is also its strength. Any one member of the coalition, if they're unhappy with the way the coalition partners are acting in government, can walk away and collapse the government. And that gives a tremendous amount of strength to anyone who participates uh, in the next government with a swing uh, with a swing block of votes. Um, 
In terms of old groups uh, rearming, again, I think the critical thing here is to move forward with integration of the Peshmerga and full integration of the Sons of Iraq, both militarily and in civilian jobs. And actually, the Sons of Iraq program has moved forward uh, quite well. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, but our sense, based on the way the budget's being allocated, uh, is that uh, the Iraqi government has been serious about this, and it's certainly something we continue to urge them uh, to be serious about. Um, and finally, in terms of uh, the neighbors and a pact with the neighbors, um, we've spent a lot of time engaging uh, the neighbors on Iraq. The president, the vice president, the secretary of state, um, and others uh, have all been regularly and deeply engaged with virtually every neighbor uh, talking about Iraq. But I think it's very important, again, to emphasize that uh, Iraqis are not uh, looking uh, to have something done behind their backs or over their backs. This is about helping Iraq develop normal relations with all of its neighbors. And as we used to say in a very different context, our basic approach is nothing about you without you. So we're not going to be uh, trying to build PACs around Iraq. We're going to try to help Iraq fully integrate uh, the region. And I think that's actually an area where Iraqis will continue to look to the United States uh, for help and assistance. Tony, thank you very much. Okay. I, as, as expected, we have uh, some immediate questions here. Yes, sir, right here. And there's a, there is a mic that you can use. Barry Schwad, AP. Before I forget it, isn't your last point built on require terrible sensitivity that you have to know the exact point at which Iran is being a helpful neighbor or being a noxious neighbor? And I don't know, because people have argued, Jim Dobbins prominently among them, that we missed an opportunity to bring Iran into uh, the situation, and it might have been better than what happened. I don't know how you're going to measure that. I will, I'll leave aside, in fact, what right you have to measure it, but how are you going to measure that? And if the, uh, uh, if the event, the dust-up last weekend, involved uh, al-Qaeda front groups, is the U.S. now in a non-combat uh, role except where al-Qaeda might be inv involved? Thanks, Barry. Um, Thanks, Tony. You, you're, you're absolutely right about the sensitivity, but in a sense it's not for us to gauge that or judge that. It's for the Iraqis, and we will follow their lead. Um, as I suggested, our assessment is that there are very strong antibodies that have built up in Iraq toward um, foreign noxious foreign interference from anyone. Iran, but also any of the uh, Sunni neighbors, and uh, from us. And uh, we have not seen, at least um, in recent months, um, the Iraqis uh, reacting well to perceived pressure uh, from uh, Iran or, for that matter, from anyone else. And so I think the gauge, uh, the measure, is really uh, from the Iraqis, and we will follow uh, that lead. And we'll see going forward uh, what uh, role the neighbors, all the neighbors, play um, in, uh, in Iraq uh, going forward. But again, it's really the Iraqis, uh, for the Iraqis to make that, uh, uh, that decision. And about the U.S. non-combat role? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. I mean, now, supposed to be the U.S.'s enemy in the region. That's why The mission going forward of the uh, 50,000 remaining troops, there are a couple of things that are important to point out. One, um, our combat mission has ended, but the presence of American combat troops is not. The 50,000 that remain uh, include uh, combat troops, but they're not in combat units uh, or combat brigades. These are folks who are prepared for any contingency. Um, second, while their primary mission is to advise and assist the Iraqis and to continue to develop their capacity, uh, they will also continue to take part in what we call partnered counterterrorism operations. Uh, Iraqis uh, will be in the lead, uh, but our guys will be there, and uh, if necessary, uh, they will um, uh, take part directly in these operations. So uh, that is something that, uh, that continues. Um, the Iraqis have made tremendous progress uh, against al-Qaeda in Iraq in recent months. As I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, um, since the election, uh, Iraqi-led operations based on intelligence developed primarily by the Iraqis led to the killing or capture of 32 of the top 42 al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, leaders. So we're seeing uh, Iraqis uh, having developed a significant capacity to take on these fights. But, again, part of our formal mission going forward until the end of 2011 
is partner counterterrorism operations. And again, the combat mission is over, but we still have combat troops in Iraq. <clears throat> in the back. Hi, I'm Wally Hayes, an independent consultant. And my question is, in both the President's speech, which I didn't, didn't, see, didn't see but read, and in your comments today, there hasn't been any discussion of how this change in policy from military to – from the Pentagon to the State Department advances critical U.S. interests in the region, uh, for example, containing Iran or ensuring a s- stable, secure supply of energy. Could you talk a little bit about – how U.S. interests are advanced by this policy. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, First and foremost, um, I think U.S. interests are are advanced by uh, fulfilling the President's commitment to end the war uh, responsibly. It is not in our interest to be engaged in an endless war in Iraq. It's not in our interest to have uh, those kind of resources tied down to continue to put uh, our people uh, uh, in jeopardy at a point in time in which The Iraqis' most fervent wish across every community is to regain their full sovereignty and at a point in time in which Iraq has increasingly developed the capacity to assume that sovereignty. And so uh, the administration uh, believes that the single best way uh, in the first instance to advance our interests is to make good on our commitment to uh, end this war uh, responsibly and to, um, in a very pragmatic, uh, thought-out way, disengage U.S. troops while at the same time um, ramping up the engagement of American civilians, uh, American diplomats, and continuing to develop the capacity of Iraqi uh, forces. Um, I think demonstrating that we're good to our word, that we're good to our commitment, that we have no interest in occupying Iraq or dominating its resources sends a very powerful and positive message to every neighbor. Um, As I suggested a few moments ago, I think Iraqis have been surprised that we've made good on our commitments. I suspect that many in the region are equally surprised. This is not the picture they paint of the United States. They paint a picture of the United States as a a force bent on occupation and domination and war. We are demonstrating exactly the opposite by making good on our commitment. So I would uh, submit to you that moving forward in a pragmatic, uh, careful, and thoughtful way on our commitment to end the war responsibly profoundly advances the interest of the United States in the region. Thank you. Sir. Uh, hi, thanks. I'm Bob Dreyfus with uh, The Nation magazine and Rolling Stone. Um, I want to follow up on what Barry asked, but let me ask it this way. It, are there any conceivable circumstances under which the United States would not withdraw uh, the rest of its troops by the end of next year, particularly if Iraq falls apart or if some of these bad scenarios that have been discussed occur? Would the president renege on that commitment? And I don't mean residual force to protect the embassy, but is this an absolute commitment by the end of next year, regardless of whether Iraq falls back into civil war or not? And, and second, in that context, and this is why I want to follow up at Barry's question, um, if Iran, which certainly has the capability of stirring up um, the Sadras, Shiite militias, other forces, um, um, so forth, does uh, get involved in that. Are, are we talking to Iran now? I mean, the Bush administration had a dialogue, which I haven't seen replicated yet by the Obama one, with the Iranian ambassador in Baghdad um, on working to stabilize uh, Iraq. Um, I know, we're, of course, we're trying to do stuff with the nuclear program, but are we talking to the Iranians about uh, Iraq? And, and if not, um, why not? Thank you. Um, The United States has an agreement with the government of Iraq to uh, withdraw all of our forces by the end of 2011, uh, and we intend to make good uh, on that agreement and on that commitment. Um, Beyond that, uh, the first rule of uh, commenting on uh, any uh, hypothetical uh, future-oriented question is not to comment. Uh, So I don't want to engage in a hypothetical uh, discussion. Let me just say this. Um, We do have... 50,000 troops still in Iraq. They will be there till the end of 2011. Um, as I suggested, while the combat mission is over, the presence of combat troops is not. 
they're fully prepared to deal with any contingencies that may arise between now uh, and their departure. And our belief and expectation is that we'll also be using that time to further help the Iraqis develop the capacity of their own security forces, and that will put them in a position uh, after 2011 uh, to be able to deal with um, any problems or contingencies uh, that arise. Um, in terms of Iran, we do not uh, currently have uh, a dialogue with Iran uh, about Iraq, uh, and uh, of course the focus of the international community uh, at this point in time is convincing Iran to make good on its obligations to that community um, on, its, uh, on its nuclear program. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, Tony, at the risk of raising a hypothetical, uh, you said the gauge was Iraq. And perhaps the more operative question is, if the Iraqi government in the next year feels that, as uh, Dr. Kuba said, uh, the perception in the region will be of a vacuum if there is no U.S. military presence uh, and if they raised the idea of a new agreement, are we ruling out cooperation on that front? And, and also, as far as the civilian presence, can you say something about the protection for that presence? There's been stories of a 6,000-man six six private army or w whatever there's going to be. We all know that there are still serious security problems and will this greatly enhanced civilian presence be able to get out of its compounds and engage with the Iraqi people? Thanks, Trudy. Um, you're right. Again, I don't want to get into a hypothetical discussion about what an Iraqi government may or may not ask for. Right now, uh, we still need to see the government formed, um, and uh, then we'll engage with that uh, new government just as we're engaged with the caretaker government now. Um, if the Iraqis put uh, any issue on the table for discussion, of course, we're prepared to discuss it. But beyond that, uh, it's, um, uh, as I said, a, a hypothetical again in anything that a new government may, uh, may put on the table or may ask for. Um, in terms of the protection of our civilians, you're absolutely right that uh, there is a very significant mission uh, going forward in terms of making sure we can protect our civilian and diplomatic personnel who will be uh, engaged uh, around the country uh, in a number of uh, very important missions in our in our consulates, uh, in our branch offices, the police training program, et cetera. And much of that effort uh, will uh, fall to uh, private uh, security contractors. That's the way, in the absence of the military, um, we do business along with diplomatic security. But as I think you know, uh, diplomatic security can't cover the entire responsibility. Um, and uh, we believe we have a good plan uh, to do just that. It wouldn't make any sense to go forward with a civilian and diplomatic mission if our civilians and diplomats couldn't do their jobs, couldn't get out uh, beyond the wire to engage Iraqis. We have a, a good plan to enable them to do that, um, and um, I'm confident as we move forward that we'll be able to do it. But it is, uh, it is, a, it is a difficult task and one that we spent a lot of time thinking through. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity to add one more, more point that's not directly responsive, but I think it's important. This transition that we've gone through, the change of mission that many of you witnessed, um, was not the flipping of a light switch on August 31st. It's been a carefully thought out and planned process that's taken place um, over the last year and indeed will still play out over the next year. Um, we began to hand lead responsibility to Iraqi security forces uh, over a year ago when we got out of the cities, and they have taken on that mission uh, for many months now. Uh, and so it wasn't all of a sudden handing the ball to them and saying, run with it, good luck. Um, second, the transition to State Department uh, and other agency lead in many of these tasks will happen over uh, the coming months and indeed the coming year. And the consulates won't be fully stood up until uh, October of next year. Uh, full state responsibility for the police training program won't take effect until October of next year. So this is a process. It's not a singular event. And in that process, uh, we're able to evaluate what's working, what's not working, make changes where we have to, and we'll continue to do that. Leif, at any point, if you'd like to make any comment, you'll, I'm sure, let me know. Yeah, please help me out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right here. Yeah. Hi, Farrah Stockman with the Boston Globe. Um, 
I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about um, the uh, sources of leverage that the U.S. will have left on the Iraqi government. It's not obviously just the um, troops uh, on the ground, but what other means do you have to influence them? And the other question I had is you were talking about how everything they're doing is within the framework of the Constitution, but there's a lot of people who look and see the, the fact that the parliament kind of adjourned and hasn't met for uh, so many months it was was tricking the Constitution. It was sort of throwing it out, and, and I was wondering if you could address that. Thanks, Farah. Um, first, uh, to the question of sources of leverage. That's, that's a, a, a very important question because there is this perception that there is a direct and proportional relationship between the drawdown of our troops and our influence uh, in Iraq, uh, and I think that's a, a fundamentally flawed um, view uh, and premise. Um, of course, there is significant influence with having 150,000 uh, troops uh, in a country. But that influence doesn't go away as they draw down. In, in the case of Iraq, uh, it changes uh, in nature. Um, and I believe we will have uh, positive points uh, of influence going forward because there are a number of things that Iraqis are looking uh, to us for assistance with uh, that um, will uh, retain uh, our influence. First and foremost, there's bringing the strategic framework agreement to life. Um, and we have uh, made it clear in our interaction with the Iraqis that that's something we're determined to do, but it's not a one-way street. There are many things that they need to do in order, for example, to attract uh, investment, to engage in, uh, in trade uh, and commerce, uh, to move forward on education and cultural exchange, uh, as well as to move forward on security cooperation in terms of the integration of Peshmerga and integration of the Sons of Iraq. So they know that there are a number of things that are their responsibility as we try to meet ours. Second, um, the Iraqis have made clear to us that they are very interested in our help in continuing to help them develop uh, more normal relations with all of their, their neighbors. And that's uh, a position, um, I think, where we can be uh, very helpful. Um, and finally, um, when it comes to um, Iraq's obligations to the United Nations under Chapter 7, we've made a commitment to Iraq to help Iraq move out from under uh, Chapter 7, and there again, they look to us uh, for assistance. So in all of these areas, um, I think uh, our positive influence will remain. But that influence um, is limited only by one thing, really, and that is what do the Iraqi people want and what do their elected representatives want. And as long as they want U.S. engagement, as long as they want a partnership with the United States, our influence uh, will be there. If they choose otherwise, that is really the marker of whether we have influence or not, not the presence uh, of our troops. Um, and then in terms of uh, the constitutional framework and uh, resolving disputes, for sure, as I suggested, in each of these areas uh, where we've had uh, um, problems or some have called them crises in recent months, uh, the electoral law, uh, debathification, the election itself, and so forth, there's no doubt that one group or another has tried to push the envelope uh, on the Constitution uh, or interpretations of the Constitution. Um, that's something that's probably not unfamiliar to uh, many constitutionally based countries uh, around the world. But I would argue that in each case, while people have pushed the envelope, they haven't uh, pushed through it, and that everything has been done within the framework of the Constitution. You can argue, for example, about whether the failure to move forward with government formation on a certain time frame violates the Constitution. There's an argument that it does. There's another argument that by keeping the first session of the Parliament open and in session, they actually haven't triggered some of the uh, clocks that are, uh, that are in the Constitution. Um, and again, maybe the... Uh, Predominant, uh, the predominance of the, uh, of the argument would be with one interpretation or another, but again, I would maintain they have not uh, worked outside of the basic framework of the Constitution, and that's very important. Leif, you're okay on all this? Um, I mean, slight, slight disagreement on this. I, I, I really think um, even the head of parliament, who is Fuad Masum, when a number of NGOs came out to say, you're violating the Constitution, and this is not on he admitted, he said, if you take me to court, to the Supreme Court, I'll plead guilty, and we have violated the Constitution. <laughs> Just for the record. Just for the record. Well, I, I think like after that comment, there probably will be a court case that's brought against him, so we'll see what happens. Dan, sir. 
Tony and Leith, I, I can't think of two people I'd rather hear talk about Iraq than the two of you. I'm Daniel Sir, where I work here at USIP. A comment first. It seems to me what Leith's intervention, initial intervention, amounted to was concern that the current constitutional system may not persist. And it seems to me that that's behind a lot of the problem you're facing in government formation. These guys are worried that this is their last chance at power. The question is really whether there's any way of alleviating some of that concern. We've done that in other situations post-conflict. It's not an unusual concern. Iraq is a particularly difficult place because foreign intervention is not all that welcome, but have you thought about ways in which we can try to ease the concern that the constitutional system will not remain in place? Secondly, on the um, administration's strong position, which you restated today, Tony, that all the troops will be out by the end of 2011, as if there is a light switch, which of course is, is not the case. And yet you talked about an Office of Defense Cooperation. Now, we all know, those of us who worry about these things, that the Navy and the Air Force in Iraq aren't going to be ready to operate fully independently uh, at the end of 2011. Can, can you square that circle a bit? Won't there be a real need for a fairly substantial number of ODC-type people uh, after the end of 2011? Dan, thanks very much. Um, uh, both, uh, obviously, good questions. Um, in terms of alleviating the concerns that Iraqis have, I think um, there are a few things that um, we've pointed out to them that um, are having that effect, although we have to see if that's decisive. Um, first of all, as they work together, uh, and right now what we're seeing is a process of the leading coalitions working very closely together and trying to negotiate um, basically a power-sharing deal. Uh, we're seeing daily engagement between Iraqi state of law, Kurdish alliance, um, uh, ISKI is also uh, engaged. And we pointed out to them two things. First, if they do come up with um, a power-sharing arrangement, and concrete uh, ideas for doing that, um, those ideas uh, and those agreements can be legislated and have the force of law uh, behind them. Second, we've pointed out something I mentioned a few moments ago, which is that in a coalition government, the very weakness of coalition government is its strength. Any one partner, if they have a decisive block of seats, can leave the government and collapse it. And that gives a tremendous amount of... Uh, power um, and alleviates a tremendous amount of concern for anyone who chooses to participate uh, in the government. If one party or another to the government is not making good on whatever commitments they make in order to get a government formation agreement, then the other party or parties can walk. Uh, so that's something that we've uh, pointed out. And uh, we've certainly suggested to them that if they do agree uh, on forming a government and that there are commitments that are made by uh, each of uh, the coalition's to that end, uh, we will expect uh, the uh, Iraqis taking part in the government to make good on their uh, on their commitments. So I think all of that has, um, at least for now, um, gone some distance toward alleviating very understandable concerns that uh, the Iraqis may have. But again, it's not uh, decisive because we still haven't seen uh, a government, and that's exactly the the hurdle that they'll have to jump, I think, to uh, to get there to have enough trust in each other to uh, feel that um, they can uh, secure the interests of those they represent in uh, a coalition government. Um, in terms of the op Office of Security Cooperation, um, this is something that we have uh, in embassies around the world in countries uh, with whom we have a significant security relationship. And so uh, our expectation is that the office in Iraq, once it's stood up as part of our embassy under the authority uh, of the ambassador, uh, will have some dozens of experts um, some from the uh, Pentagon, uh, other civilians, who will be helping the Iraqis with um, a couple of things, increasing, uh, continuing to increase their overall capacity in military matters, and also helping them integrate any uh, American equipment they may choose to purchase 
uh, for their military going forward, and that's going to be uh, the um, connective tissue uh, on the security side going forward. And again, uh, we are now uh, still some time away from the end of 2011, and we are going to be using that time um, with um, the ongoing significant military presence that we have to continue to help the Iraqis develop their capacity so that by the end of 2011, uh, they're in a place where um, they're confident that they can really assume responsibility uh, uh, for these missions. So I think the combination of the time that we have between now and the end of 2011 and this Office of Security Cooperation as it gets stood up uh, will help answer those questions. Yes, ma'am, right. Did you have one? Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I promise, just as, uh, while you're formulating your question here, I promised Tony that he could walk out of here at 315. He's got a meeting he's got to be at, so we, I will keep this promise. Well, Leith has promised to answer any remaining and, questions. And Leith will answer any further <laughs> questions. <laughs> Very good. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, I'm Elaine Sorreo. Uh, I'm with Foreign Aid Through Education. And I'm. my concern is the issue of the coalition government. And the importance of it, as you've pointed out, to the stability not only of obviously Iraq, but to the region. And right now, it's a very fragile coalition. Um, can you address a little further about the importance of the, particularly the Kurdish role in the coalition? Uh, and I and I say that because I, I, I'm just observing. I, I deal with other areas of the world usually, like Pakistan. But right now I've been observing what's going on with the Kurds. And if, for instance, right down the block on 16th Street, the Kurds have have their own s- sort of mini embassy. Would I call it that? I don't know. So anyway, uh, with that in mind, with, with, with their sites in mind, and with what the sites of the region and the needs and everything, can you... Both of you speak a little further to the Kurdish issue. Sure. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we've um, said to all of our uh, Iraqi uh, interlocutors uh, is that uh, the United States is uh, deeply committed to um, helping uh, the Kurds um, sustain uh, the significant gains that they've made uh, in Iraq uh, in terms of um, being uh, fully and meaningfully integrated into the life and leadership of the nation, uh, but also uh, retaining the uh, day in and day out uh, control of their of their daily lives. This is something that we feel very uh, strongly about, uh, and we've made that clear. But what's very interesting um, is that in the context of this government formation process and all the discussions that are going back and forth, there's an understanding by the other uh, leading coalitions in Iraq that both to get a government and then to have a government that functions and to keep Iraq moving forward and together, uh, they have to address the uh, outstanding uh, concerns uh, of the Kurdish region. And so I think the, uh, the Kurds are in a uh, good position to make sure that their uh, interests are taken into account and the outstanding issues that they put on the table uh, are dealt with in a forthright uh, and, uh, and fair manner. And certainly we've seen a lot of courting of the uh, Kurds by uh, various other uh, coalitions uh, looking to form a government. And it's not the kind of situation where you can make a promise uh, in order to entice one group or another to be in on the government and then renege on the promise the next day because, again, any member of a coalition government, despite its complexities, has the ability, if they have a decisive block of seats, as the Kurds almost certainly will, to um, walk away from that government and, and collapse it. So I think that's important. Um, second, uh, we'll continue to work very closely, as requested, with um, the Iraqis to work through some of these outstanding issues. And I might add, the United Nations has an absolutely central role to play. Um, in working through these issues. The, and the United Nations has been doing a terrific job um, in doing just that. Um, the leadership of the UN uh, in Iraq uh, with um, a number of very uh, important people uh, has um, really helped bring uh, Iraqis uh, together to talk about and work through the outstanding issues. And so we're looking to the United Nations to continue to play that role uh, going forward, including on Kurdish 
uh, uh, Arab issues. Leif, do you uh, anything to add? Sir. Oda Aberdeen, Tony, how could you have a stable Iraq when you don't have a national army or a national police? Let's be clinical. Today in Iraq, you don't really have a national army nor a national police because the loyalty of the police and the army to, to a certain parties, certain individuals, and certain foreign countries. I think it's a major challenge to creating stability if the situation continues. And then I have one other question on Iran, Iraq, and sanctions. Iraq today is the biggest, Iraq is the biggest market for Iran. The Iranians are dumping their substandard goods, which they can't sell anywhere. They're selling electricity to Iraq. I have seen numbers that say that Iran earns between seven and $10 billion from its trade with Iraq. What are, we try, what are we doing to stop the flow of trade and money from Iraq to Iran? Um, I, would, uh, I would submit that there actually is uh, a national army and that it is uh, developing not only its capacity but its sense of nationalism uh, every single day. It continues to be a work in progress. But what we've seen again uh, in uh, recent months um, in particular is that the army uh, has remained um, loyal to the government of Iraq, not to uh, individuals or coalitions, that it is taking on uh, extremists of various uh, stripes uh, from uh, emanating from various uh, communities. It has not been uh, just going after one group or just going after another. Um, and critically moving forward, you're right that until there is real integration of the Peshmerga, and um, full integration of the sons of Iraq, uh, we won't have a fully nationalized army, but that process is ongoing. And I've actually been encouraged um, by the performance of the army, not only in dealing with extremist groups, but in the way it's done that. And we have not seen um, overt factionalization or the army uh, doing the bidding of one coalition or one individual or an outside country. Um, again, to the contrary, what we're seeing, at least thus far, and I acknowledge things can always change, uh, but thus far we've seen uh, an emergence of nationalism in Iraq that includes uh, uh, the army. And if that process continues, that will be, um, I think, uh, a good thing. Uh, in terms of the trade and commercial relationship with Iran, um, there's actually something very striking that's happened over the past year. Uh, trade uh, with Iran has been stagnant. If you look at the numbers, uh, trade with the Europeans, uh, as well as with us, uh, has been going up. And we're seeing Iraqis determined to diversify their commercial relationships, uh, both in the region and indeed around the world. But again, uh, Iran is uh, a neighbor by geography, by history, by other affinities. It's going to have a relationship. And uh, that relationship can, uh, in, in as many aspects, be a positive one, we hope, uh, over time. But Everything we've seen, including the trade numbers, suggests that Iraqis uh, have been significantly diversifying their commercial relations uh, beyond Iran, particularly with Europe uh, as well as uh, with us. I'm going to have to uh, call this uh, uh, initial session of this uh, academic year, Tony, uh, uh, to a close. I think this is – I agree with Dan Serwer. It said this is, couldn't have been a better pair to start us off on this thing. Great uh, explanation. Uh, please join me in thanking our two panelists.